Hey, in this short meeting or in this video, we're going to talk about a method for solving homogeneous linear equations that have constant coefficients. It's actually an algebraic uh, method. We do have to use some calculus in here, but it reduces to an algebraic problem. And so we're going to use this method with second order DEs, but just to illustrate how we get to an algebraic problem, we'll start with a simple first order DE. And we already know how to solve this, but I just want to use it to illustrate a new method. So we know that uh, y prime then would be negative b over a y, or y prime is a constant times y. So this could be popul simple population growth, it could be radioactive decay, so on and so forth. We know that the solution, the only non-trivial solution, has the form e to the power of mx. So what we want to do is find the value of m. Again, I know, you know what the value of m should be, but we're going to find this value of m using an algebraic method. And so the idea is we're going to go ahead and say, well, the solution has to have this form, so let's calculate the derivative of that form and substitute those into the differential equation that we have here. And now what I can do is factor out the e to the mx, e to the power of mx. And what's left inside is just going to be an algebra problem now. I know that the exponential function can never equal zero. So the only way that this expression can equal zero is if the am plus b equals zero, which gives us m equals negative b over a. So let's use the same idea with a second order differential equation. So again, we're going to assume that the solution has the form of y equals e to the mx. Take the derivatives there, substitute that back into the differential equation, factor out the e to the power of mx, and I'm left with a quadratic equation, algebraic, purely algebraic quadratic equation. And we can solve that using a number of methods. Maybe we can factor it. If not, we can use the quadratic formula. And this algebraic equation is what we call the auxiliary equation. It's just a helper equation to find the solution. Now, we know from algebra that if you have a quadratic equation, you can look at the expression under the radical sign. That's called the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac, to show that you really have three cases. If the discriminant is positive, then you're going to get two distinct real roots that we'll call m1 and m2. If d equals 0, m1 will be the same, m1 and m2 will be the same, and they'll be real numbers. So we have a repeated root with multiplicity 2. And if the discriminant is negative, that means I'll be taking the square root of a negative number, which will give me an imaginary number. So I'm going to have two roots. They're going to be complex, not real. And uh, moreover, since we all a, b, and c are going to be real numbers, then they must be complex conjugates. So if I solve the auxiliary e equation and get two real distinct roots, then my general solution is going to have the form of y equals c1 times e to the power of m1x plus c2 times e to the power of m 2x. Now, if I have real repeated roots, we're going to have to do uh, some actual work here. Certainly, one of the solutions is just going to be e to the power of m1x. But because we have a second order differential equation, 
there should be two functions in our general solution. What could the second function be? Well, let's make use of our uh, reduction of order formula that we can find where you know y1, let's find y2 by using this formula. So my p function is just the constant b over a. And uh, since I know that the discriminant is 0, m1 must be negative b over 2a from the quadratic formula. So that means that I could actually uh, replace y1 with e to the negative b over 2a x. Now, when I take y1 and square it, I actually get negative b over e to the negative b over a x, which is the same thing I get in this formula by uh, integrating uh, p dx and then putting the negative sign in front of it. So that's just going to be the integral of 1 dx. Uh, that's going to get multiplied by my e to the m1x. And uh, so I get x from the integral times the y1, which is e to the m1x. So my solution when I have real repeated roots is, well, I'm going to have a constant times e to the m1x, but then I'm going to have a constant times x e to the m1x. That's my second function. And in case three, where we have complex conjugate roots, let's just remember what complex conjugate means. That means one of the roots is alpha plus i beta. The other one is alpha minus i beta. Remember, i is the radical of negative one. Alpha and beta are both real numbers. And in this case, we take beta to be a positive number. So our solution could be written as c1 times e to the power of alpha plus i beta x plus c2 e to the power of alpha minus i beta. I have a typo there. It should be i beta. So let's make room for the i and put it in there. All right. So alpha minus i beta x. But We'd like to have our solutions written as uh, real valued functions. And so this has complex values. So what we're going to do is we're going to make use of Euler's form, which, formula, which says e to the i theta is cosine of theta plus i sine theta. So that means that we could first use properties of exponents to see that I am going to have an e to the alpha x times e to the i beta x. And then here it's going to be e to the alpha x e to the minus i beta x. And then using Euler's formula, I can factor out, notice that I can factor out the e, c1 e to the alpha x in our first term and c2 e to the alpha x in the second term. Applying Euler's formula, I'm going to take the angle or the input here as negative b beta x. Uh, and now I'm going to use some uh, trig identities or trig properties. Cosine is an even function, so cosine of negative beta x is the same as cosine of beta x, whereas sine is an odd function. So sine of minus beta x will be the negative of sine of beta x. So I went ahead and applied those properties. Um, I'm actually missing in e to the alpha x here. So let's go ahead and put that in there. All right. 
So now we've got everything written out. And again, I gotta be correct about what I write here. Let's make sure we've got the e to the alpha x. All right. And so let's collect the like terms. I have two terms that have an e to the alpha x cosine of beta x. And then um, I've got another two terms uh, that have should have an e to the alpha x sine of beta x. So let's go ahead and fix that. All right. And then in our next slide, what we're going to do is we're going to fix this again. Oops. And if I choose C1 equal to C2, then that means that this sine of beta x will uh, drop out and I'll get a solution then where I only have the cosine of beta x. And so If I choose C2 equals negative C1, I got kind of a overlap there. There we go. If I choose C2 to equal negative C1, then the cosine term drops out, and I'll be left with just a sine term. So, all right. Now, that means I have two uh, possible solutions that come from here, and um, so my, using the superposition principle, what can I do? I can say, well, of course I can multiply uh, any solution by a constant. So I'll multiply these solutions so that uh, I just have uh, a coefficient of one or a coefficient of some arbitrary constant C1 on the cosine, an arbitrary constant on, of C2 on the sine. And I'll factor out the e to the alpha x. So alpha again is the real part, beta is the imaginary part of the solution. And fix my slides here. There we go. All right. So there's a couple of equations that are worth knowing the solutions for. Uh, so this is where you have no y prime term. So you either have y double prime plus k squared y equals zero or minus k squared y equals zero. And we're taking k to be a real number. So solving the one on the left, we're going to get two imaginary roots. And so uh, we just saw the general solution would just be uh, C1 cosine of kx and plus C2 sine of kx. On the right-hand side, we're going to get two distinct real roots. So we could just write our solution in this form. But if we do a little more analysis here, we really get an interesting solution. If I choose C1 and C2 to be both 1 half, I get one half e to the kx plus one half e to the negative kx. That is actually the definition of the hyperbolic cosine of kx or cosh 
of kx. And if I choose c1 equals 1 half and c2 equals negative 1 half, then I get uh, the definition of cinch uh, or hyperbolic sine of kx. So our solutions then, when we have a plus k squared, are the regular circular trig functions, c1 cosine of kx plus c2 sine of kx. And then when I have a minus k squared, I could write the solution using the hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. So c1 cosh of kx plus c2 cinch of kx. If you have higher order equations, you can apply this idea. Uh, the only thing is, is you're going to get an auxiliary equation, which is an nth degree polynomial that you'll need to solve. If all of the roots are different, then the uh, general equation is just going to involve uh, n exponential terms where the uh, exponent is going to be just the corresponding root times x. If you have uh, a repeated root, say m1 is a rep repeated root with multiplicity k, then the uh, linearly independent solutions have the form, well, just the plain exponential, and then the x times the exponential. That's what we saw in the second order. Well, what if you have a, a higher multiplicity? Well, then you just continue uh, increasing the exponent on x. You'd have x squared times the exponential, x cubed times the exponential, and so on, until you get to x to the power of k minus 1 times the exponential. So let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, first one is a third order equation. And so from the auxiliary, or from the equation, we can see the auxiliary equation is going to be m cubed plus 3m minus 4. So how did I get there without having to go through all the steps? I know that the exponent is the same as the order of the derivative, and then the coefficients are the same. So this is third order derivative, so I get an m cubed first order derivative, so it's just m to the power of 1 with a coefficient of 3. And here, uh, there is no derivative, so that'll be my constant term, minus 4. Now, I can observe that uh, just by looking at this, that m1 equals 1 is a root. I just do some substitution there. Uh, 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 minus 4 equals 0. So knowing one root, I can divide my auxiliary equation by m minus 1. I'm going to use synthetic division. You could use uh, long division, long polynomial division. Remember in synthetic division, you line up your coefficients here in one row. The zero stands for the fact that there's no m squared. Uh, you bring this m1 down, and then you multiply and add. 1 times 1 is 1, plus 0 gives me 1. And then 1 times 1 plus 3 gives me 4. 1 times 4 plus negative 4 gives me 0, which tells me that the quotient is going to be m squared plus m plus 4. And so now i got to solve m squared plus m plus 4 equals 0. I'll use the quadratic formula to do that. I actually get uh, complex conjugates here for my solution. So the form of the solution then is that I have three roots here, my real root, m1 equals m, and then these complex conjugates for two and three. And so the solution is, well, I'm going to have one term for each root. So c1 e to the x, that's for the m1. The real part of these solutions is negative 1 half, so that goes outside the brackets, e to the negative 1 half x. And then the coefficient on i is going to be my angle multiplied times x, of course. So I'll have c2 cosine of root 15 over 2x 
plus c3 sine of root 15 over 2x. All right, a very uh, closely related uh, example would be, now I'm going to have uh, 3 times y double prime instead of 3 times y prime. So there's no y prime term. And so my auxiliary equation is m cubed plus 3m squared minus 4 equals 0. Uh, m1 equals 1 is still a root. So I still need to do my synthetic division in order to find the, the quotient. I'm going to divide by m minus 1. And again, I bring down the 1. 1 times 1 is 1 plus 3 gives me 4. 1 times 4 plus 0 gives me 4. 1 times 4 plus negative 4 gives me 0. So the quotient is going to be m squared plus 4m plus 4. And that's just m plus 2 squared. So now I've got m equals 1. That's a standalone root. And then I have a repeated root, m equals negative 2. So my solution then is going to have the c1 e to the x. That's from m1. Then c2 e to the negative 2x. And then remember with repeated root, your second solution there would be uh, of the form x e to the negative 2x, so with a uh, constant c3. And here's a fourth order uh, differential equation. Its auxiliary equation is m to the fourth plus 2m squared plus 1. Now this is uh, something that we can factor. It's actually m squared plus 1 in quantity squared. So I'm going to have four roots, but I'm going to have one root, which is just i with multiplicity 2, and the other root is negative i with multiplicity 2. So with complex conjugate roots, I would have a solution here. In this case, the real part of my solution of my root here is zero. So that's why I don't have an exponential here. I don't, if, if I had an exponential, it would be e to the zero, which is one. So the imaginary part is one. And so I would have um, c1 times cosine of x plus c2 sine of x. But then that's a repeated root as a multiplicity of two. So I'm going to have a second term where I take the form of the first solution and multiply it times x. So I hope you found this information useful. It's a very uh, easy technique to adapt because in the end you're just solving an algebraic equation and then applying the results to one of our three cases.